wonderful to be here with you today. Um, Susan mentioned Chantel and I are heading off later today uh, to head back to our hometown of Ortonville, Minnesota um, to uh, serve at the summer camp that's about four miles from where I grew up and maybe six from where Chantel grew up, something like that. Um, I don't know how to tell you, I don't know if I can adequately describe it well enough, uh, the mixed emotions we have about this place. Um, I don't think we've, I don't think we've sacrificed more for any other place in this world. <laughs> uh, our first five years of marriage, all of our vacation time went into serving this camp. And uh, I, I've lost more sleep over this place, uh, waiting for God to provide staff, good quality men and women that can serve as camp counselors for kids. Um, it was agonizing and it was so much work. Um, but this is also the place that I cut my teeth on leading people and caring well for people and speaking to kids and singing so loud and so much that I have no voice by the end of the week. This is a place that um, was worthwhile when on Thursday nights we pray over the seniors and we see them uh, who God has been building in them and it's worth it. Um, but I, I would definitely appreciate your prayers. I'm heading off this week to summer camp with a pocket full of uh, cough drops and I don't know if it's cough or if it's uh, allergies or what it is, but definitely appreciate your prayers that uh, God, God always shows up here. And uh, I, I, hope, I hope to get more involved uh, in future years here with uh, summer camps in the area. Uh, summer camp ministry is always worthwhile. It can be difficult, it can be challenging, um, but it's always worthwhile. So definitely appreciate your prayers in that. Would you pray with me as we go to Lord's go to the Word this morning, Father God? We thank you this morning for your goodness and your faithfulness that I have seen evidenced again and again in my own life. Um, God, you always come through and uh, provide, Lord, just what we need to have faith in you each day. I ask Lord this morning that you would help us in this continued look into the life of David uh, and his life with you. Um, Lord, that you would inspire us, that you would challenge us, that you would convict us. Um, not to be more like David, but to be more the Nate and the Chantel and the Marshall and the Kathy and the Barb that you have created us to be. Lord God, you have created us, uh, as we learned this morning in Sunday school, you have created us as living stones to fit right where you desire for us to be. Help us grow where we're planted. Help us make a difference where we are. Help us to believe uh, and have confidence, not in ourselves, but in the craftsman who is forming us and shaping us and fitting us in place. We love you. We trust you. Help us to trust you more. Amen. We've been in 1 Samuel uh, looking at how Israel had hungered for a king that might rule over them. Uh, they had a reasonable reason to want that. They wanted to be like all the other nations. Every other nation had a king. Um, we saw how God warned them of the dangers of a king. A king will take from you, God said. A king won't lead you as God himself would, but they wanted a king anyway. And so they got Saul, who looked the part. But Saul was jealous and murderous. He never took responsibility and never repented. Saul fell short. A couple of weeks ago, we saw in our continuing story of our faithful God and this man after God's own heart, a man named David, how David spared the life of King Saul twice, refusing to do what looked best to his own eyes, refusing to kill Saul when given the opportunity. Instead, David waited on God and obeyed God's command not to murder. I want to look briefly today at Saul and Jonathan's deaths at the end of for Samuel, and then spend a little more time looking at how David responds to their deaths. Then, uh, just an introduction today of the kind of good king that David grows into at the beginning of 2 Samuel. Having seen David spare his life twice and being terrified because he knows that God is with David and has departed from him, Saul sought out a medium in chapter 28. I mentioned that last week to conjure up the spirit of Samuel who had died. 
In what can only be called a strange event, Samuel actually appeared before Saul and said, 1 Samuel 28, 16 and 17, Why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? A little bit of a, a little late in the game, buddy. Why do you consult me now? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. Everything I've said, is, it's, it's happening right now. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. A short time after this, just as Samuel had said to Saul, he and his son Jonathan are chased by the Philistines in chapter 31, and the Philistines kill Jonathan and two other sons of Saul. Outnumbered and surrounded by Philistines, Saul asks his shield bearer to kill him, to spare him the shame and, uh, of, of, of suicide. But his shield bearer refuses, and so Saul falls on his own sword. The story here, and, and I, 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 I tried to weigh whether I should even include this part. The story here, and, and don't take this harshly, but the story here is not the deaths of Saul and his sons. That's not the story. They are tragic, they are sad, but they are not the story. This is the nature of life. In Kurt Vonnegut's classic novel, uh, Slaughterhouse Five, I don't know if I'm the only uh, fiction reader here, but I love, I, I like his writing a lot. It's a novel written about a human, uh, human frailty in the face of war. Every time in Slaughterhouse Five that a terrible thing happens in the book, Every time a man is lost in battle, every time a character loses hope, which tallies 106 times in the book. I love sad stories. I don't know if you know that about me. Um, every time that happens, 106 times in the book, the author declares this simple phrase at the end of the sentence. So it goes. Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle. So it goes. It is hard, it is sad. The first king of Israel, God's anointed, and David's best friend, of whom there isn't anything negative written about in Scripture, Jonathan, are killed. It's sad, but it's not the story. The story is what David does with their loss. After years of running from Saul, we might expect David to be rejoicing. Finally, finally the day is here where I don't need to run for my life anymore. Finally, the day is here where I don't need to look over my shoulder. I don't have to worry anymore. Finally, let's rejoice. He's finally safe. The, antag uh, the, uh, the antagonist, the pursuer is dead. But that's not what we find in David. Because if there's something to admire in the story of David, something we see in David that we ought to desire for ourselves, it's that at least here, at least now, David isn't looking out for his own best interest. His primary desire is to obey God. And when Scripture tells us that David was a man after God's own heart, it means it. David loves God, and so he loves what God loves. And he's heartbroken over what breaks the heart of God. So let's see how David responds to the news of Saul and Jonathan's death. At the beginning of 2 Samuel, David is taking a brief pause in his battle against the Amalekites. He and his men have been holed up in Ziklag for a few days when an unknown figure in torn clothes and, and dust on his head, the text reads, approaches and tells David that Saul and Jonathan are dead. For 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 5 through 12. And then David said to the young man who brought him the report, How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? I happen to be on Mount Gilboa, the young man said. And there was Saul leaning on his spear with the chariots and their drivers in hot pursuit. When he turned around and saw me, he called out to me, and I said, What can I do? He asked me, Who are you? An Amalekite. Then he said to me, stand here by me and kill me. I'm in the throes of death, but I'm still alive. So I stood beside him and killed him because I knew that after he had fallen, he would not survive. And I took the crown that was on his head and the band on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. And David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. 
They mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and for the nation of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. Now again, I would expect David to be rejoicing he and his men that, that Saul has died. For months, David has been on the run from Saul, living as an exile among the Philistines. To the human eye, it didn't look like David had a chance to ever return to his family, let alone to become the king of Israel. Saul had effectively ruined David's life. And now he's gone. He's out of the picture. There's renewed hope, a chance for things to return to normal, the way they should be, to be the king that David was prophesied to be. So why not rejoice? God had kept his word. Why not celebrate God's confirmation of David? But instead they grieve. And this is no show of grief. This is no pity cry. There's no hint of anything fake here. But this is unanimous, catastrophic grief. Even though David was forced to flee and live in exile among, from his people, he never lost his love for God's people. The loss of their king would send all of Israel into mourning. And if their grief doesn't convince you, then maybe what David does next just might. Verse 14, David asked him, the Amalekite, this man claiming to have killed Saul, why weren't you afraid to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called one of his men and said, go, strike him down, kill this Amalekite right here, right now. So he struck him down and he died. For David had said to him, your blood be on your own head. Your own mouth testified against you when you said, I killed the Lord's anointed. Interestingly, it's actually very likely <clears throat> that this Amalekite messenger was lying. The account of Saul's death in the previous chapter tells us that Saul was found dead, and then his body was hung up on a wall. Saul was not found still alive by this Amalekite. It's very likely that this Amalekite came to tell David that Saul had died at his hand <clears throat> in order to be rewarded for sharing this good news of, with Paul's potential successor. He's expecting a reward. He's expecting, look at what I've done. I've brought you his crown. I've brought you the band on his arm. Uh, where's, my, where's, my, where's my reward for this? But that's just not the kind of guy that David is. Instead of a reward, on hearing the Amal Amalekites claim that he killed King Saul, David immediately has him put to death. And we're reminded of the reverence that David has for God's will. God anointed King Saul as leader, and even when Saul was wrong and departed from God's purposes, even though Saul treated David harshly, it didn't matter. David submitted himself to following God's desires. As followers of God, as Christians in our modern context, we often get distracted. We might long for some clarity on what exactly is God's call on our lives, our particular purpose at any given moment, our purpose at 20 or 30 or 55 or 80. But our number one, our, our top priority is unchanging. It's to glorify God. How does one do that? We obey him. Well, spell it out for us, Pastor Nate. What, what does that actually look like? We remember, as David did, that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6, 12. David's enemy was not Saul. David's enemy was not Saul. Rather, Saul was a man chosen by God to lead his people for a time. Saul's death, as potentially beneficial as that may have been for David, was not to be celebrated but mourned. Saul wasn't his enemy. 1 Peter 2 is a chapter that should cause us some pause. It's a chapter that Peter wrote to offer practical instruction to Christians living in, a diff in difficult times. What, do, what does obedience to God look like when things aren't falling our way? What does obedience look like when things aren't fair? When life doesn't go as we expect? Hear the words of Peter, a man who tried and failed numerous times to obey God. A man who failed numerous times to be a good follower, who, who, who fell into 
the shadows at the worst possible times. But now on the other side of the cross, he came to understand God's call on his life to obey. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 18. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves. Slaves, here's a word just for you. In reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Verse 21, Peter tells us the reason for this. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. I hope that gives you pause. It certainly goes against much of what I want to do. We can so quickly become angry people, angry about wrongs suffered, angry at those we strongly disagree with, angry and impatient with others we expect more from, angry at our leaders because they should know better. But it's funny. You mentioned even the thought of Christ on the road to Calvary, cross slung over his shoulder, and I'm left without much to be angry about. I want you to understand that David in his flesh, in his humanity, had every reason to be angry with God. Or sorry, to be angry with Saul. He had every reason to reject Saul, even to celebrate his death, but he didn't. We as the people of God are at an important time in human history. Will we put Christ first? Will we honor him with our language? Will we honor him in our relationships with the unloved and the unlovable? Will we honor our God and how we treat people who are not just different? Back home, my my mom is Minnesota nice. Um, I have people I know that you'd say they put the aggressive in passive aggressive. Not not my mom as much, but my mom's Minnesota nice and the meanest thing my mom would ever say about a person, she would never call someone dumb, she would never call someone stupid, that is cruel. The meanest thing my mom would ever call someone is different. They're different. And I know exactly what she means when she says different. Our call is is to not just love people who are different. Our call is to love people who are wrong. Right now, present tense, wrong. Will we honor our God in how we treat people? Um, people who are even unrepentantly sinful. I encourage you to to pray something simple in moments like that. Something like, God, give me your mind. Help me see more than just what I want. This sort of thinking is, is evident in David. God's will was more important than David's own will. He trusted the sovereignty of God. In your life, if you believe that God is truly on the throne, that nothing shakes him, nothing surprises him, then embody your belief. Don't be shaken. Pastor Francis Fragapani said that too many Christians become bitter and angry in the conflict. If we descend into hatefulness, we have already lost the battle. We must cooperate with God in turning what was meant for evil into a greater good within us. This is why we bless those who would curse us. I I think this thought is wonderful. It is not only for their sakes, but to preserve our own soul from its natural response toward hatred. The rest of 2 Samuel chapter 1. David cries out a beautiful lament over the deaths of Saul and Jonathan. He implores the people to weep for Saul, verse 24 who clothed you in scarlet and finery. And David grieves for Jonathan, who he calls a brother, who was very dear to him, whose friendship with him, he says, was wonderful. And then having waited this time, just 
waiting to be king, David does not immediately become king of Israel. Know that? It doesn't just happen like Saul's death. Instead, David inquires of the Lord at the beginning of chapter 2. Quite the contrast from Saul, who just a few chapters earlier inquired of a medium. David asks God what to do. How refreshing is that? That should strike you as refreshing and new and different. A king over Israel who inquires of the Lord. A Christian today who inquires of the Lord. That's refreshing. That's new. That's different. That's special. That, that's something of note. We ought to do the same all the time with all that we do. And God says, go to Hebron, the, play, the private anointing that David received from Samuel all those years ago, 20 years ago, is going to need to be done in public to show all the people that David is the anointed of God. But even then, David doesn't become king over all of Israel, only king over Judah in the south. Saul's remaining son, a man named Ishbosheth, became the king of the rest of Israel and reigned for two more years. The name Ishbosheth is pretty interesting. It means, it can mean man of shame. He was also called Eshbaal in the Hebrew, meaning Baal exists or fire of Baal. This man would be king for two more years over Israel. A lot of waiting, a lot of interruptions in David becoming king. So much waiting demanded of this man. We see everything from this side of God's story with his people. But for the people living in this story, living in this time, it must have been very difficult to continue to trust, to continue on. In chapter 3, the commander of Ishbosheth's army is murdered. And in chapter 4, Ishbosheth himself is killed. And then in chapter 5, having waited, David finally becomes king over Israel. God fulfills the promise to David in God's timing. David retakes Jerusalem from the Jebusites who have overtaken it. And then David <coughs> took residence of the fortress in Jerusalem and he calls it the city of David. Quick, nerdy sidebar uh, over here. In 1993, Old Testament scholar Richard Hess, who was an Old Testament prof for me at Denver Seminary, was at a conference debating with a number of secular scholars. This is 1993. They were debating the legitimacy of the Old Testament. Was it written when it claimed to be written? You see, a, a glaring issue that existed up into that, at that time, up to 1993, was that there had never been any sort of archaeological discovery confirming the existence of a king named David, whose scripture claims to have lived in and around the years of about 1000 BC. This was problematic for Christian scholars, but it just so happened that during the conference, during a talk that my professor was in, in 1993, a discovery was made at a place called Tel Dan in northern Israel. The Tel Dan Stella was discovered, and on the ninth line, it's highlighted there on the bottom right, the ninth line down in Hebrew, is the first known reference to the house of David, the Et David. Evidence that the house of David existed when Scripture claimed that it did. Evidence that the Bible is the revealed word of God, and we're just confirming more and more as we dig through the past. Nerdy sidebar over. God established and created a covenant with the house of David. To help us get into the mind of David during this time of becoming king of Israel, listen to this excerpt from Psalm 95, written after David became king over a united Israel. Look at where David directs our minds and our attention and consider where he directs our praise. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord, he is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. 
Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. All the glory, all the glory, all, all the leadership, all of the leading, everything that could be possibly attributed to anyone, it all goes to God. David takes none of the credit. I was just along for the ride. I got to see firsthand the goodness of God. Talk about why testimonies matter. I have a hard time arguing with Psalm 96. David saw it all. He was there. He waited. He, w- he had every reason to be frustrated in that season. All the glory goes to God. How do we apply this? I would encourage you today. To believe that God is sovereign doesn't mean that life's always going to always look the way that we want it to. Doesn't mean that I am always going to know what's coming. He reigns over all that we see and all that we don't. And though we don't understand all that He wills and all that He allows, neither does a sheep know the shepherd's ways. But the sheep trusts the shepherd. I, I know very little. I know very little. This is all I have to go on. This is it. We have to trust the shepherd. It's a hard command, but it's, it's what we have. We must trust our shepherd. David did. David obeyed. He followed God's commands, and he would later write Psalm 23, detailing the ways of our great shepherd. Let's follow our God in his way, even or maybe especially in difficult days. I want to close with this quote from G.K. Chesterton, and then I've got a benediction for us. G.K. Chesterton wrote, that to love means loving the unlovable. I like his definitions. That's love. To love something unlovable, not just something easy, not just something beautiful. To love the unlovable, that's what love is about. To forgive means pardoning the unpardonable. Faith means believing the unbelievable. Hope means hoping when everything seems hopeless. Would you pray with me? This benediction from Psalm 28. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices and with my song I will praise him. The Lord is their strength and he is the saving refuge of his anointed. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also. Bear them up forever. Father God, we need your shepherding. We need not just the the kind, gentle guidance of your staff. Lord, we need the correction of your rod to tell us when we wander from where you want us to be. Lord, would you please, um, I, I, I pray for increased clarity for those here at part of this church that, that feel like they lack it. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to them clearly and, and uh, in ways that they can understand. Uh, Lord, I, I've I have felt very blessed for much of my life that I, I feel like I've had a sense of where you're leading me and what you're asking me to do. I don't often know where, I don't often know who, but I know, Lord, wherever I am, I ought to be pastoral. I ought to care for people well. I so that you would help us to have a renewed sense of what your desire is for each one of us. Lord, help us to recognize the gifts that you've given and don't let us fail in using them. And and some of those gifts might just be having a rock-solid trust in you that we are not shaken, that we're not infants tossed about in the waves of difficult times or challenging teaching, but, Lord, that we stay to your side, holding on to you and you holding on to us. In the name we pray. Amen.